Hey, Jim Hoffman here from EMS Office Hours, and this is your Monday Minutes. Uh, today's Monday Minutes, I want to talk about something that you know a lot of us encounter in EMS, and you get these intoxicated patients, right? But not everyone who ends up drinking or who is a little bit intoxicated, they're not always just a drunk. There can be bigger issues at hand. Um, you know, something like a, an acute alcohol intoxication uh, can really be uh, more of a form of poisoning than you think, and it does have a lot of the same issues uh, that you might see with um, other types of poisoning. So just, you know, things like uh, other CNS depressants, okay? And it's important to know, too, that it doesn't always really take all that much uh, in t- intake of alcohol to get to those higher blood levels. Uh, you know, even something is a half a pint of that hard liquor, like a whiskey, let's say, might actually end up uh, causing a patient to get that severe alcohol intoxication. So, you know, of course, with something like this, your mo- most immediate dangers, your primary concerns are your watching for that respiratory depression and watching for the patient possibly aspirating either, uh, you know, on their vomitus or other stomach contents, you know, because they've got that suppressed gag reflex. So when you get a patient like this, okay, what are we going to pretty much do for them? A lot of what we do ends up being more supportive. So if they're unconscious, right, you're going to treat them just like any other unconscious patient. You know, you're going to establish their airway. You're going to see if they have a gag reflex reflex, see if it's intact or not, um, maybe consider pa- putting the patient in the uh, lateral recumbent position, maybe even consider suctioning them if needed as well. Now, if the patient doesn't have a gag reflex and they, they're having a problem maintaining their airway, you know, it might be the type of thing where you're going to have to go ahead and intubate the patient in order to secure and protect their airway. Remember, guys, just because they're drunk doesn't mean that we have to just, you know, treat them as sort of like this drunk type drunk tank type of a patient, right? They are still having a genuine medical issue going on here. You know, a patient doesn't have a gag reflex. It doesn't matter if they're unconscious because of, let's say, they're having a stroke or uh, some other type of medical issue. You know, it doesn't make a difference if it's medical because of that or because of something along these lines, you know, intoxication. So if they don't have a gag reflex and you're feeling that they're having an issue maintaining their airway, intubation might be the way you're going to have to go these types of patients, okay? You know, get your IV, monitor the EKG rhythm. You know, of course, you know, you got to keep in mind uh, patients that are uh, heavily intoxicated might actually end up having some dysrhythmias based on, you know, toxic effects they could have uh, from, you know, that apply to the heart. So keep that in mind, just in mind as well. Check their EKG rhythm, get that IV, and check their blood glucose level as well. See if maybe they are hyperglycemic uh, at any point. If that's the case, go ahead and treat that based on your protocols and what you can and cannot do for these types of patients. Another thing on protocols too, some protocols will allow you to go ahead and give uh, 100 milligrams of vitamin uh, vitamin B or that thiamine, right? So check your protocols on that and uh, see if that's something that you're allowed to do. And of course, you want to go ahead and start transporting your patient. Now, what about um, seizures? Well, you can actually have patients getting seizures from the withdrawals of alcohol. And mostly with these patients, you're going to actually maybe start seeing this occurring uh, you know, 12 to 48 hours um, after uh, they took their last drink, okay? So let's say they've been drinking heavily for a long time and they suddenly stop, okay? Now, they might have a lot of other withdrawal-type symptoms. We're going to talk about that in a second. But this, the seizure end of it will probably start occurring, again, 12 to 48 hours after that last drink. And you're going to use the same type of treatment and considerations that we just talked about with the acute alcohol intoxication, but you also might want to consider those benzodiazepines for seizures as well, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, Ativan or Valium, whatever it is that you carry, whatever it is that you use in your protocols, that might be something you want to go ahead and either consult with med control if you have it on standing orders to go ahead and treat the seizures that way. Now, the next thing is the uh, delirium tremens, right, the DTs. 
we hear about this all the time in EMS, and this is the type of thing you get the calls often too, right? Patients having alcohol withdrawal. And sometimes, you know, their perception of what the withdrawal is isn't the same of actual true DT, but there is a, sort of a wide range of signs and symptoms when it comes to that. And it, it, the thing to note is that it can be a fatal type of a complication from the alcohol withdrawal, okay? You're talking about usually starting 48 to 72 hours from their last drink. And just keep in mind that, you know, I was looking online about this and you can actually have it even longer, maybe even a week to 10 days after their last alcohol intake before they might start getting some onset of some of the symptoms. So what are some of the, some of the symptoms we're talking about? Well, the confusion, you might get the tremors, of course, that restlessness, maybe a fever, diaphoresis, and hallucinations. And this is a big one because this ends up being kind of difficult for us as providers to sort of handle because the hallucinations that these patients will get are of the frightening kind, right? Things, you know, snakes, um, spiders, you know, stuff like that is the type of stuff they might start hallucinating on, which was going to make it difficult for us to handle them as uh, as patients, right? And also the other thing you look at is hypotension, right? The alcohol is not necessarily you know, having the best food and liquid intake. So you have to think about uh, hypotension because of that, because of maybe of vomiting, things like that. So keep that in mind, and that's something you might end up wind up treating. So again, treatment of these patients. Well, delirium tremens, you, again, a lot of supportive stuff going on. You're protecting them from any type of injury. Um, you want to support their cardiovascular. Again, maybe it's fluid challenge. Maybe it is checking their EKG for things. Supporting their respiratory, make sure that the respiratory issues aren't aren't any type of respiratory issue that's evolving. Um, that's what our supportive type thing is that we're going to be doing for them. Oxygen, fluid for those hypotensive type patients, and again, guys, general monitoring and support of what you want to do. Treating these patients is pretty much again supporting them, and like I mentioned before, the whole thing with the hallucinations. You got to be careful for that because again, the patient can be a little difficult to handle, right? They're going to be agitated, maybe even combative to you. So, you know, do the best you can to keep them calm. Let them know what you're doing for them, what you think might be happening to them, okay? Uh, and I think it's important, too, that when you're transporting these patients, uh, keep the dialogue going. Keep speaking to them in the ambulance, during your patient care, during your assessment, okay? This is going to help to kind of orientate them to what's happening and what's going on and it's also going to hopefully reassure them that things that the hallucinations that they're seeing that there's a cause for it that they're not going crazy that there's a cause for why they're seeing what they're seeing okay because of this alcohol withdrawal okay so uh, just some quick tips here guys for this Monday minutes I know it's not a lot of stuff uh, here we can just it really can be an actual full hour presentation when you think about it um, but I'm hoping that these quick sort of tips and um, outline of what you can kind of expect to see some tips on how you can actually treat it before again most of what we're doing is supportive uh, unless there's something else happening like the airway or cardiovascular and in those cases we're going to treat the patient much like it would any other patient that is having a respiratory or cardiovascular issue going on okay it doesn't matter really the cause oftentimes it's you know what at the end result winds up being and what we can do for what we're seeing okay so just keep that in mind guys um, I hope you can actually use these Monday minutes, guys, you can see the rest of them, and I do these each week along with the major podcast over at emfofficehours.com. Go check them out over there, um, and if you have some minutes of your own, be sure to send them over to me. It's Jay Hoffman at ems-safety.com. I'd love to be able to do a Monday minute on a topic that you suggest. So that's it for this week, guys. As always, Jim Hoffman, stay safe.